buying a lake house somewhere you'd eventually like to spend more time at and renting it out in the meantime when you're not using it is a fantastic idea if it's done correctly. But there are a lot of things to be aware of before you buy that lake place. If it's not done right, the mistakes range from minor annoyances to costly and time-consuming repairs or could even be as serious as not being able to afford that property and potentially losing a lot of money. We're gonna talk about how to buy a short-term rental and the things that you need to know before you buy that waterfront property and how to find a good one. I have an insider secret to boosting your revenue that honestly, it's almost too good to share, but I'm gonna share it with you anyway. And make sure to drop me a comment below. If you already own a short-term rental, where is it? If you're thinking about getting started, let me know what area you're thinking about. So you've decided you wanna have a waterfront short-term rental. The first thing to be clear on is what is your end goal? What do I mean by this? Well, is this purely an investment property that you're buying to make money on through cash flow and tax benefits and hopefully appreciation? Or is your goal to purchase a lake place that you're gonna use from time to time with your family and rent out when you're not using it in the meantime, effectively having renters pay all or most of your mortgage and ongoing expenses of your lake house? Either one of these goals is fine, but make sure that you are crystal clear on what you're looking for because it'll completely change your property search. So here's an example. Let's say you're married and have two kids. Well, if your goal is to buy a lake place and offset the cost of that by renting it out and then use it as an occasional vacation place for your family, then you'll need to buy a lake place that will fit your family. This might not be the most profitable short-term rental option for you, but that's okay because it's what you all want for the future. Now, in the area you're looking, let's say a one-bedroom cabin might bring you the best returns. And if you're purely looking for a short-term rental that's gonna bring you the best returns, then the configuration of the property won't necessarily matter for your family. You're just looking at your bottom line. I'll give you a personal example. A few years back, we wanted to add another waterfront property to our real estate portfolio, a short-term rental property in another state. And the real estate agent who helped me there asked me this exact question. Is this purely an investment or is it somewhere my family and I are gonna use for ourselves sometimes? And I answered the question, oh, it's purely investment. But then the properties that I was most interested in were actually homes that I would wanna bring my own family to visit and stay at someday. So I actually wasn't clear for myself what our goals were on my own property search. And in the end, after I analyzed the returns on the properties that I would wanna have for my own family to enjoy someday versus the purely investment properties, the properties that were purely for investment actually returned more. So we went with one of those. Next up is choosing different areas where you would be open to having a short-term rental. If your short-term rental is a property that you eventually will be using yourself, then you may have some ideas in mind already, or maybe it doesn't matter quite as much, as long as it's on a lake within X hours drive from your house or X hours plane ride. But if this is purely for investment, then look for locations where either there's less seasonality, meaning the occupancy rates are fairly high year, or else if there is big seasonality, then at least the rental income you can get during season is high enough that it doesn't matter if there aren't high rental returns other times through the year, because the high occupancy rates during season more than cover the low rates off season. Every location has its own season. In Minnesota, where I live, there are places that are super popular to go during the summer for swimming and boating and hiking and summertime stuff. And then in the fall, this same area is an incredibly popular destination to look at the leaves changing colors and have bonfires and go for bike rides and hikes. And then during winter, they have a ski mountain in addition to cross country trails. So this location has extremely high occupancy rates and probably a lot higher than you'd expect from Minnesota. Looking for a location that is is close to popular regional or state or national parks or hiking trails is always a good bet, as is somewhere with a good diversity of activities. And waterfront is always going to be popular. If you can buy a property on a lake, people will rent it for the views, the swimming, for kayaking and stand up paddle boarding, for bonfires by the water to trailer their boat in. I could go on and on. And that's just during summer. During winter, if the lake freezes like it does in Minnesota where I live, people will still wanna come stay there. Maybe not quite as much, but if it's a good lake for fishing, they'll come for ice fishing, they'll come for winter walks on the ice, they might even cross country ski on the ice. It all just depends on your area, which is why you want to think about the reasons people will visit that area during different times of the year. Looking at the Chamber of Commerce 
visit us website for that area can be a good start if you don't already know why people would want to visit that area during the year even if you don't know exactly what local event or attraction is causing the rates to be higher or lower during that time you at least have an idea of what the popular times to visit would be i've got more tips for you on learning about an area's occupancy rates so watch on now you've really put some thought into a few places where you'd like to buy your waterfront short-term rental but before you get too excited and start frantically scouring realtor.com and zillow now now is a good time to connect with the local real estate agent in that area who can give you an idea what the local re regulations are around short-term rentals. Don't just find anybody online. A waterfront property is a special property with very unique components to it. And it needs somebody who's experienced and knows what they're doing. I have a network of agents around the country who specialize in helping people find that great waterfront property for them. So make sure to get in contact so I can put you in touch with someone who focuses in the area you're looking. That local agent will be a great first point of call for the rules and restrictions around short-term rentals. But listen to what I'm about to say. You have to double check for yourself and not not just take someone else's word for it. This is your money, your investment, your life. And some of these lake places cost in the millions. So if your plan is to buy a lake home and rent it out for the next few years, then look at the city website and any restrictions they have around short-term rentals and also call the city yourself. This might take an hour or so to do, but it's a big investment and it's worth protecting. So you're going to do it right. Every city does this differently. Where I live in Minnesota, you can have one city that doesn't allow short-term rentals or any rentals under 30 days, only to step across the street into the next city. And their rule is that every individual can own and operate a maximum of one short-term rental in that particular city. Then you can zip across town and all of a sudden you're in a city where the city only allows 25 short-term rentals and rental licenses in the entire city. And some cities have no regulations whatsoever. So how are you actually gonna pay for this bad boy? Financing a short-term rental is different from financing a regular house. First, you'll likely have to put down 25% minimum. And when you put down 30%, the loan terms and interest rates are more favorable. Next, the interest rate is going to be higher for an investment property than for a home you plan to live in. It used to be that if the property you were purchasing was going to be used as a second home, it would qualify for the same interest rate that you'd be able to get for your primary residence but lenders have done away with that now. And don't forget, if the property isn't already being used as a short-term rental, then projections of what you think that property is gonna bring in aren't gonna be able to be used by the lender to help you qualify. It has to be actual income that the property already generated as a short-term rental. Your real estate agent will have at least one helpful and proactive lender that she can recommend. So don't just go online and start looking. Take a recommendation from someone who sells real estate day in and day out. She'll know who the best of the best is so that you're well taken care of and get the best rates and terms. And of course, if you're paying cash, you won't have to worry about any of these considerations. At this point, you found a great agent who clued you into a great area where people love to come and rent a lake home. Your agent has set you up on a search and you found out about a beautiful lake place on a coveted lake and short-term rentals are allowed. Woo! Now it's time to crunch some numbers and make sure the numbers work for you. The first really easy way to quickly analyze a deal is to use the AirDNA Rentalizer tool. It's completely free and you just sign up for a free login with AirDNA and then plug the address into their Rentalizer tool and voila, it will pull up either what that property has already generated as a short-term rental in the past, including nightly rate and occupancy rate, or else what it predicts that rental will generate in the future. Now be careful when you're looking at these projections because the cleaning fee is built into the nightly rate on this platform. Form. and the guest typically pays the cleaning fee so it won't actually be revenue to you unless you're actually doing the cleaning yourself which you probably won't so make sure to back that out but this is where I always personally start with analyzing a deal. AirDNA has reports on areas available for purchase as well I'll drop a link in the comments below. The more money you put down as a down payment, the more the property is going to cash flow. So calculating the cash on cash return is a helpful way to analyze a deal. That's calculated as the annual before tax cash flow that the property brings in divided by the total amount of cash invested and you have your cash on cash return. If the numbers make sense at a high level, then it's time to really geek out and do a deep dive. You're going to find other similar listings in the area on Airbnb and VRBO that are similar to this property you're looking at, and you're going to see how much they're getting per night and open their calendars and see exactly how often they're booked. 
you're gonna get a free short-term rental Excel spreadsheet from AirDNA or Stessa. Again, I'll drop a link in the description so you can check them out. Into that spreadsheet will go your estimate of how much are the monthly utility bills, how much you're gonna have to pay a property manager, a guesstimate of how much maintenance and repairs will be, how much property taxes are, as well as any hosting and occupancy taxes that you'll have to pay, the cost to furnish the property, if there's an association, what the fee is for that, supplies, towels, linens, putting the dock in and out every fall and spring, landscaping. You're gonna put all of these numbers into your spreadsheet and then you'll estimate based on the occupancy rates you found on AirDNA and through your research online with Airbnb and VRBO, what that property is gonna be able to bring in. Don't forget that if this is a property you're planning to use yourself to budget that into your numbers too. You aren't necessarily gonna rent the home from yourself during the time you're staying there, so that will be a time you aren't getting income. You'll go back to your Excel spreadsheet over and over and over again, and it actually becomes a lot of fun to analyze the deal. I know that sounds kind of dorky, but it's a fun project, and real estate is a fantastic way to build wealth, no matter whether you're buying for purely investment or for something for you and your family to enjoy a bit of along the way as well. Now for my top tip that's almost too good to share, but I'm gonna share it with you anyway. I come across properties from time to time where the revenue it's bringing in is literally mind blowing. It's so much higher than other short term rentals. And the common thread that is almost always that these properties have more than one unit that's able to be rented. But, and this is a key, all the units are able to be rented as short-term rentals. So if you're able to put an accessory dwelling unit in the yard of your short-term rental, or you're able to build an apartment over the garage or separate the lower level into its own apartment, and you're able to legally rent both of those dwellings as short-term rentals, then you've stumbled upon a potential gold mine. I'd love to hear where you're thinking of buying a short-term rental or where you already own one. If you're interested in learning more about lake homes, I have another video, five things no one tells you about buying a lake property and I'll drop the card in the corner above.